Hello and welcome. We are Tools in the Shed, powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm James. With me are Matt, who, Hi. in the week of Halloween, has been researching haunted roads. Yes, I have. Uh, as well as Tom, who's been gazing into his crystal ball and looking at the future of Holden and Ford in this country. And we'll check in with our favourite billionaire global saviour in this week's Musk Watch. So stay with us. But first, Tom, you have been doing some crystal ball gazing. We've had our very own Steve Corby has been looking into Holden's future because their uh, chief executive, Chairman Dave Butner, said, I've got the keys to the GM candy store. Yeah. Um, I've been assured <laughs> that I can choose from anything in the Cadillac, Chevrolet, Buick um, range, and they'll make it for us and um, all of that. And that story's gone very well. A lot of people clicking on it, obviously a point of interest. What have you what have you found out there? And then we've got Ford on the other side of the equation. Yeah, so they're both up to interesting stuff at the moment. It's both a tumultuous it's a tumultuous time for both brands. Yeah. In the in the country. Uh, GM's sort of it's like they it's like they don't know what to do. They're giving Holden the keys to their extended empire of vehicles yep. yet again. Yeah. Um but what that what that actually means for Holden is a bit. It's still a bit confusing. Just saying that they have access to all all, all these all these vehicles. It it's like saying they don't really know well, what I mean, direction the, to the take. The context it. is Holden had hitched its itself to Opel. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Formerly a GM subsidiary, uh, the current Commodore, the current Astra, all of those are Opel products. Now Opel gets bought by PSA, mm-hmm. who runs Peugeot and Citroen. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, that's not quite an easy relationship, yeah. a, a highly inappropriate one in a way. So all of a sudden, eyes turn to Detroit and what have you guys got? So that's what's happening. And really, you've got to say anything's possible for a price. You know, Detroit can say, yeah, you can have anything you want. Then it comes <laughs> down to what it's going to cost. You yeah. Know? Mm. Well, I think um, like the takeaways from... Corby's story and the comments section especially is, uh, <laughs> a, a, yeah, a lot of people would like to see something like a Cadillac branded as a Commodore, but that ship has sailed, I think. Oh, I, I think we're now talking, totally. we're in a post rear wheel drive sedan era. Yeah. As much as, as much as I'd like to see sure. a, a CTS with one of those mad new V8 engines that they've only just developed and apparently partially developed in Australia as well, that engine. Yeah. Um, as much as I'd like to see that and as much as a lot of like more hardcore car fans would like to see that, uh, I I just don't really see a business case for it happening, especially yeah. since the Cadillac range as it stands now is all uh, in sort of left-hand drive. So, well, I mean, I, it, Sorry, Matt, oh, go sorry. ahead. No, you don't see it being a, a cyclical trend, like something sort of coming back in fashion sort of later down the line or just the way the the car market is uh you can look at most countries around the world and it's just a gradual suv it's the decline of the hatchback in the sedan it could be matt it's interesting i mean i think various stars are aligning in the sense that sedans are no longer the go suvs mm-hmm. have come to the fore Different means of propulsion are happening, you know, yeah, be it sure. electric or, you know, hydrogen electric, all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So your traditional three box engine, cabin, boot mm. type sedan is probably, it, it's going the way of the yeah, dinosaurs. Sure. It's okay. just not happening. Yeah. And especially since in uh, like the biggest emerging markets and the biggest sort of stalwart markets, like the US is going full SUV, China being the biggest emerging market in the world is mm. all about SUVs as well. So mm. I think just in terms of the economies of scale, it's going to be tough. Yeah, that, sure. that, that said, I suppose what you've got now is the opportunity for Australia to be in at the ground floor for whatever's coming. And there's always been a lot of chat about that. Oh, we'll have right-hand drive in the next generation car. But I think what Dave Butner's saying is front and centre – we'll be there putting our yeah. hand up for stuff that we want. Mm. So whether it's a Camaro, whether it's a Corvette, whether it's a, a Chevy Bolt, you know, uh, the next generation of electric car, mm. they will have the option to say, we'd love to be in this program and please include right-hand drive. Yeah, and on, and on that topic, um, uh, Corby does mention in his story that he uh, he knows of the fact that the Bolt and Volt have been spotted testing around Australia. Sure. Um, and the same um, so is the, kind of interesting. The Bolt and the Volt are different. Yeah, so the Bolt cool. seems unnecessarily Whoops. confusing. but <laughs> One letter makes all the difference, Matt. And, oh, and, okay. Uh, it, so the Bolt is based on the uh, uh, Spark, so the little... Yes. Which they don't sell here anymore. Yep. But, um, you know, now that Group PSA is taken over the mantle of stuff coming from Opal, it could come back. Um, 
and the vault was here. It didn't sell particularly well. No. But now Even maybe it will come back. In well, that's right. Too. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. And Australia is, uh, you know, not supporting the sale of alternative uh, yes, vehicles yeah. at all. Yeah. There, there's no incentive from either state or federal government for people to buy an electric car. Yeah. And the ele- the infrastructure is still, you know, relatively modest. So there's all kinds of impediments standing in the way of someone buying an electric car. And but not least of which is price. And on the SUV front, uh, they have also just missed out on the Chevy Blazer, which yep. all reports from the US seems pretty good. Yeah. With, uh, left-hand drive, so. Yeah, I mean, it is a smorgasbord. There's a whole bunch of stuff there, huge pickup mm. trucks. I mean, HSV is currently modifying the Silverado to be right-hand drive. They're doing that locally. Uh, we'll see what happens with that car. It'd be interesting to see if there's any demand for it. Yeah, um, I've... I've I feel like there are a lot of roads here that a Silverado would not fit, fit on, on, right? Yeah. yeah, parking a Silverado <laughs> in any city, inner city suburbs of yeah. any major city in this country would yeah. be a challenge. Yeah. Well, uh, we actually have right. this fantastic photo of uh, this a similarly sized ram that we had not so long ago. Yep. I, I've got a photo of you actually reaching out of the sunroof and touching the roof of to, our car park. To, to try and just yeah. to check that we weren't going to oh, scrape the turret. Man. Yeah, but yeah. that's how close the roof that's yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> Practicalities of life, isn't it? Just yeah. fitting it into your own garage or a public parking garage or God yeah. knows what. So there's all that. And then Ford. Tom. Yeah. So Ford, there's been a lot of uh, interesting stuff coming out of Ford and Volkswagen lately about uh, the two big brands getting together to make their future a little bit more sustainable. Mm. Um, so this comes off the back of a Ford press release back in June 19th, which says Volkswagen AG and Ford are exploring a strategic alliance. Yeah. Uh, Ford was very clear to come out and say early on in that press release that it would not involve an equity arrangement. So that All means right. the brands will not have ownership of each other's property or stocks or anything like that. But Mm -hmm. Volkswagen have come out several times after this and said uh, some interesting things, like they would like to co-invest in electric vehicle drivetrains and platforms with Ford. Yeah, they they're, they're even open open to sharing something like uh, like their new ML based platform. Yes, uh, their mm-hmm. modular architecture with Ford, and they're yep. very interested in getting back from Ford something like their uh, commercial vehicle platform. So, yes. you know, hmm. what kind of future does that lead to for Ford and Volkswagen? Could it be you know twenty twenty five comes around and we have uh, an electric Amarok, Amarok. on a Ranger chassis. chassis. Yeah. yeah, it could be. I mean, when you think about uh, Toyota Supra, BMW Z4, think about mm-hmm. Mazda, yeah. MX-5, Mayada, and uh, Abarth um, Roadster. Yeah, sure. All of those things make sense because if you've got a, a factory that has a little more capacity, you want to get in cahoots with someone else, okay, mm-hmm. you can tailor this car, put your own engine in, but we'll build it. It just makes sense for both parties. So mm-hmm. without any kind of equity swap or, or merger, just to share tech and capacities in that way, on the face of it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think the Supra will be quite interesting because it's such a it's such a different balance of brands yeah. there. It's like you've got the yeah. sort of <laughs> very premium BMW and then the very, you know, affordable sort of yeah. aims of Toyota, you know, will they be able to come together to make a car? Like, will it be a BMW or will it be a, t- a Toyota? I think, yeah. yeah. Look, I'm old enough to have done an exercise in Bondi Junction in Sydney when the whole uh, button car plan thing was happening and Toyota and Holden were sharing models. So you had the Holden Apollo, which was a camera, oh, yep. mm-hmm. and you had the Nova, which was a Corolla. I remember taking a Toyota Corolla and a Holden Nova, parking them side by side outside that big shopping centre in Bondi Junction and asking people which car they'd prefer. Mm. It's the same car. I mean, it's the same shape, everything. Mm. Oh, the Holden. Got to go the Holden. Or, oh, it would be the Toyota. So hmm. people buy yeah. brands. You know, people will buy a badge and a brand. Um, and so mm. long as it meets their kind of requirements or needs, that's fine. I think we're very mm. close to it. Yeah, and I think those car sharing things, when you're out there in consumer world, um, there's not that kind of uh, appreciation of the finer points of it. Yeah, when it is something, and it's something that I notice quite a bit in, um, especially in our comment sections, mm. um, is like kind of like this perception of like it being a numbers game of no, no, but this you know like statistically, mathematically, objectively, you can prove it's better, but. So often people ignore that it's such an emotional thing. Oh, it's thing. emotion. It's all it's, emotion. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, true. Unless you're, I think once you get into the commercial uh, vehicle world, oh, where you're, sure. yeah. you're buying a tradie truck, 
you want it to be reliable. You need it to have fuel economy. All if you're those buying, things. Buying a fleet of taxis. Yeah, you do. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's where you get into those things. Like, but I know the Mustang isn't great for it, but I just really feel it. You know <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and people are willing to put up with all kinds of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, that you might criticise um, in a review. That's it's up to them. You know, um, mm. if they love the car, you'll you'll put up with a lot of things like. You know, any relationship. Mm. Well, spe- <laughs> speaking of taxis, just really quickly, another interesting brand uh, lineup is uh, London Cabs, now owned by Geely, the yes. big Chinese conglomerate, ah, yeah. who also owns Volvo. And I saw an interesting photo a little while ago, one of the motor shows. They they had the the next generation London taxi, electric. Mm-hmm. It, ha- it has all Volvo switchgear ah, on the inside. Oh, really? So, well, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah that's should be good. interesting. Well, speaking about premium product, it's time for a word from our sponsor. In 1914, two Aussie visionaries decided it was time for a new kind of car. After meeting face down on the floor of the Bridge Hotel in the Tuca, mates Ern Alcock and Horry Wheeler began working on their dream, and three years later the Winton Motor Company was born. Our founders knew Australians needed a rugged car for tough local conditions, with no-nonsense performance and breakthrough design. Their first production model, the 15, known to Winton enthusiasts the world over as the Mongo, was an unstoppable 15-cylinder force of nature, which set the benchmark for the Wanderers, Wildcats and Turbos that have followed in its illustrious wheel tracks. As Prime Minister Billy Hughes, standing next to the first Mongo, uttered those famous words, She's a Ute, Australians knew they had a winner on their hands. And 101 years later, Winton remains at the frontier of progress and performance, with the groundbreaking 2018 Winton Turbo exported to more than 100 countries. We think Ern and Horry would approve. The Winton Motor Company. Go, Australia. Okay, well, Winton, what can you say about Winton except good things? And what can you Mm. say about Frosty Chops, our man uh, at the coalface at Winton? He's been out and about, and look, as we know, Frosty's been a special advisor to Cricket Australia for many, many years, Mm -hmm. Uh, and he's been doing some brilliant uh, work in shaping the board's recognition of the recent Ethics Centre report Mm -hmm. on Cricket Australia and the uh, the Premier team's uh, behaviour. He told me yesterday, the culture isn't arrogant, the board is solid as a rock, and Chairman Dave Peaver will be in place for as long as he wants to, but uh, apparently Dave Peaver resigned uh, last night. So that doesn't play well. I'll get on to Frosty and find out what's happening. And Winton's sponsorship of the One Day Internationals and the 2020 comp for this summer uh, is a done deal. So look out for Winton um, during this summer's uh, cricket season. Now, That's now, a good get. Yeah, it's a good get, isn't yeah. it? Oh, Winton. It just goes from strength to strength. Now, <laughs> Matt, you've been looking at the subject of haunted roads. Yes, now, I have depends on where you are if you're heading home late at night and it's dark <laughs> enough lots of roads can be feel oh, like a haunted yeah. road but mm-hmm. what, what have you found out um okay well so basically uh i, I you, you always hear all these stories from haunted roads from around the world uh and i was very curious about australian ones uh partly because i was wondering if there were some that i could go and check out myself <laughs> because i'm clearly the character in a horror movie who goes you know what I'm sure the vengeful ghost road isn't yeah. that scary. You're the first one killed. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's the same t- in any zombie apocalypse. But you're riding with game. the last girl. There's always the last girl that's killed in the horror yeah. movie, and the first guy that gets yep. killed. Yeah. Okay. That is, got it. That is me. Yep. Um, but no. So I I did a bit of a dive into haunted roads from around Australia, and found some really interesting ones, and ones as well that I had never heard of, because as with most folklore uh, and urban legends, there are the, the famous ones that you know about. We all know about Wakehurst Parkway, right? Right. Yeah, they've had the documentary made about it recently. Yeah. So many accounts of people who have driven on that road and found weird and stuff it, happening. And it's a road that cuts straight out of suburbia mm-hmm. into bushland yes, and into then reconnects with suburbia on the other side. Yeah. So it's a pretty major thoroughfare too. Yeah, and that stretch of bushland has a pretty grisly history uh-huh. um, for all of their... Some really nice walking trails and really beautiful scenery, but also just some nasty stuff yeah. has happened there. Uh, but And the main stories that come out of Wakehurst Parkway is... Uh, 
there are there are two main ghosts that they talk about. There's one uh, which fits the vanishing hitchhiker wow. model of story. Which do you guys? So you've know? pulled up to pick up a hitchhiker, and then there's no one there, or how does that work? It de- it depends. The story changes. Yeah, from place to place and time to time. This version of it, they will just appear in the car. In the car? In the car, yeah. That's a bit presumptuous, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you haven't even pulled over to, you know... No, you in. haven't said they could come in. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's actually one of the things that people who uh, have experienced this kind of activity say that the best thing that they did was to just very politely say to the intruding ghost, you're not welcome here, please leave. That's a pretty collected thought process when you've just had someone appear next to you. And you yes, can't. yes. What about screaming and veering off the road? Well, and it's funny that you say that. Right. Because that also happens quite a bit. Wow. Um, and actually one of the other roads on this list, uh, Lemon Tree Passage, um, right. which is up, uh, up near Newcastle. Newcastle. Oh, um, yeah, I know. I've heard of that because, one. Yeah. Just for reference, Waco's Parkway is in the northern beaches in Sydney. Yes. You know, for yes. people who don't know. So it's now a ma- major arterial road as well, sure Waco's Parkway. Yeah. So now we're in Newcastle. Yes. Uh, about, you know, 160-odd k's north of Sydney. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, and you have the Ghost of Lemon Tree Passage, which also had a movie made about it. Uh, but this one, the, the story... It's hard to pin it down to any sort of one particular death that's happened around the area, <laughs> which well, which normally is the case with a lot of these sort of yeah. myths and legends. Um, but according to the urban legend, the ghost of Lemon Tree Passage will appear to you if you're speeding down this stretch of country road, and it'll appear in your rearview mirror. As is that a because of, the ghost was killed in a speeding accident? That's the theory, yes. Really? And that it will show up to kind of warn you. The thing that I've found with that, though, is that if you're already speeding down a deserted country road late at night and you have a ghost show up... That's not a safety issue. It's no, a, it's no a that's not going to bring self, you under control. The ghost trying to warn you is effectively doing the exact opposite. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. is it the classic ghost in the middle of the road facing you off, steering you down, No, slow it down? chases you. Chases you? Yes, yeah. Awesome. Uh, and it actually... Um, uh, apparently, and this is, I don't know how true this is, but, um, rumor has it that, uh, police officers up in that area have had multiple instances of pulling people over for speeding down that road. And when they've said to them, what, what the hell were you doing? I was uh, trying to summon the ghost. Really? Yeah. So people have blamed to try their... speeding on trying to summon a ghost. Wow. <laughs> yeah. How do you write that ticket up? Yeah. yeah. Reason for idiot. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, and I think the other the other one that I found really interesting was the ghost of Mount Victoria Pass, All which right. is the oldest one on the list. Yeah. Uh, and she has apparently been haunting Mount Victoria Pass since the 1800s. So before wow. even. Or like cars were on okay. that section of road. And what's her modus operandi? Um, she was uh, murdered ah. um, al- along the, the side of the road and she just kind of is sort of... Spooks people out. Yeah. And so she would appear and scare people's horses. Uh, there's a, actually a Henry Lawson poem about her. Really? Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and apparently some people will still occasionally see her, but sightings of the ghost of Mount Victoria Pass are not as common. Oh. She's, she's getting on. Well, exactly. And the reason for it is hilarious. Okay. It's because they think that um, we're going too fast to see her. She's uh, used to spooking horse carriages. So I see. And we're just flying past her too quick to sort of notice Needs her. Needs her up there. a game, you know, get some training on board. Yeah. and Just yeah, start know, getting man. into people's cars like they do on Waco's Parkway. Yeah, <laughs> cars have been around for a while. Like, it, how long does it take you to adjust? <laughs> You know I wonder what I mean? if these ghosts, the you know, ghost. come together for some kind of conference each year and issues like that are brought up. You know, yeah, there's a keynote right. speaker on the speed of cars and yeah. how it's changing from horses and stuff. Or if you're <laughs> if you're a ghost from the 1800s, are you then frozen in your time period? So you're Precisely. seeing a car driving past going, what, what the is hell? that? Exactly. Or are you moving with the times? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Or can you, you know, travel in the future? Come, oh, yeah. yeah. All those things would be up for discussion. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm. All right. Well, now. Speaking of things that are up for discussion, I have a bone to tick and, uh, pick, and I want to put it under blowing a gasket. Now, uh, a guy called Dave Kindig, people who watch uh, a subscription TV might know it as Kindigit Customs. Uh, he's a classic American customizer, has at SEMA this year displayed a 1955 Mercedes-Benz 300 SL, the mm-hmm. Gullwing, the hardtop car. 
Uh, and he's installed a V8. He's customised the interior. He's lowered it. He's swapped out the rims and God knows what else. And if it's based on a real 300 SL, I'm proposing that he should be shot. No Siggy, no blindfold, switched off at dawn, changed my mind. Does, does anybody else see this as sacrilege of the highest order? Or uh, the alternate point of view is, wow, what a cool custom. To me, it's wrecking one of very few cars you know, that were out there to begin with. Yeah, this is horrific. You are right? This yeah. is not okay. No, it's not. And aside from any of that, in my opinion, it doesn't really look very good. I mean, what he's done, I don't think is successful. If it had become aesthetically, if it improved it, I think he's just sent it backwards. Mm. Um, can, you, did you he... see this car, Matt? It's, it's, he's put I a, didn't, know. He's put a red interior in it. Um, he's put a, I don't even know, Ian Kelly, our man, uh, one of our regular contributors for Oversteer Mm -hmm. was onto the story and it's got a red kind of presumably custom leather interior in there. Yeah. Some kind of American V8 of some description. Yeah. And to me, it just looks horrendous. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a great look. (laughs) (laughs) I think that, and it's like having, having the history and the impact of that car explains yeah, I can appreciate that it's yeah ugh, not not great, and that it's it's the kind of car that you sort of want to leave as close to original as you do. But yeah. also, too, as someone who doesn't know a lot of deep motoring history, yeah, uh, there's almost an attitude of oh, well, that's a f- yeah. you know a <laughs> fun thing that you did with sure. this thing. <laughs> sure. Anyway, look, I, I think our listeners and viewers should go and have a look at the story. Absolutely. Um, Make their own minds up, and we'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, I know there are strong opinions on both sides of this discussion. <laughs> it's one that hit home for me because I really love that vehicle, sure. and to see one uh, have that done to it uh, really, really hit home. Anyway. Have you seen one in the flesh, SL? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And i got to say, for my money, the preference is the Roadster, the one that came mm. after it, the soft top car. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. That's one of the all-time greats, in my humble opinion. All right. Now, speaking of driving cars it's time for what's in our garage and tom you have been driving a honda crv it's the vi so VI. tell us where that fits into the hierarchy of things and what you make of it in in general terms yeah so the vi is the absolute base model so before before mm, i don't know halfway through this year you could only pick from uh vti uh vti s vti lx which is the seven seater and then, oh no, VTI L, which is the seven seater, and then the VTI LX, which is the top model. So I did drive the LX earlier this year, which is the top model, and uh, it's, you know, for what it's worth, it's a very nice feeling SUV. The one thing I do like about the CRV over um, something like the Tucson or the CX-5 is how soft and comfortable it yep. is. It doesn't try to be sporty. Mm-hmm. It just it just doesn't. It, it's got huge tires on it. It's got soft leather right. in the LX. It's got lovely light steering. It's yep. just a really nice family car. It doesn't try to be anything that it's not. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, this one, the VI, is uh, much cheaper. It comes in at under 30 grand, so it's 29290 And um, they've stripped some things out, but yep. not all the things out. So it's a bit odd in terms of the spec level. So does it retain that comfort, like smaller rims and, and bigger kind yeah. of tyres, comfy kind yeah. of ride and stuff? And actually from the outside, it's really hard to tell that it's a base model. It looks, okay. it looks amazing. Yep. Like the paint is just the same paint you'd have on any other CRV. It's got huge, like not huge, but it's got... 17-inch alloys, yep. which look great. Uh, they're two-tone coloured, everything. And it's got massive tyres on those, so it's still comfortable. Still comfortable on the inside. It's got um, it's got like a weird kind of swimsuit kind of material on the seats, which is fine. It's okay. easy to clean, okay. but it looks... Swimsuit oh, or like, wetsuit? So like, like it wicks moisture or... Uh, yeah, kind of. I don't know. It's kind of a weird material. Uh, right. I wasn't like I wasn't 100% a fan of the material, but it, it looks the same and it's kind of... It's okay. Like It's, it's, not, it's, enough. it's not like a pleathery type thing. No, so it's like not it like a get pleathery kind of... or something. Yeah, it's it's like fine. Um, but then there's some other weird stuff. Like, so the... They've stripped out the leather bound steering wheel, which is really nice in the other cars. It's one of the like the top points that I have. Right, oh. the LX beautiful steering wheel. They've just got this crappy resin one that doesn't feel particularly nice. Okay, uh, which is fine because it's a base model. But then it has like a, a digital dashboard, great for a base model. Mm. Yep, electronic parking brake, 
great for a base model, hill hold, all that sort of stuff. But then it's got a terrible multimedia system. It's this tiny little screen, tiny little <laughs> five inch screen, uh, really low resolution. Yep. Uh, Gaffer taped onto the dash. Looks yeah. may as well be. Um, it's actually it's just actually an iPhone. iPhone. Yeah, 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 it, it it's doesn't. It's an old Nokia. It doesn't have touch capacity. Phone connectivity is limited to Bluetooth, which wouldn't sync my contacts. I could receive a call, but I couldn't make one. Wow. Um, so again, this is different to the premium model. Yeah. Premium so in the LX, point. you get a, I think it's a seven-inch touchscreen uh, with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and uh, it's look, it's not a great system, but it, yep, it's you know, par for the course. All right. In terms of car multimedia systems, but th- this one in the VI, like it's one of the main things they've taken out of the car. Cool. To get it under that thirty grand price thing, and I just think it's. It's it's just kind of naff. It's not a nice okay. bit of hardware. Well, all that detail, you've put it into a review. Yep. Um, it's going up very shortly, yep. so mm. listeners, viewers should look out for that, If uh, especially if they're in the market uh, for one of those, of course. But, mm. Matt, you've been in an entirely different realm. Uh, you have yes. had nothing around you. It's two wheels rather than four. Mm-hmm. It's the Peugeot Micro uh, yes. electric scooter. What yes. do you make of that? I almost crashed it. <laughs> yeah. That was rather hilarious yesterday, actually. Yeah. So I, uh, for, for context, uh, I was uh, riding it around the office, um, as a few of us had been. Yep. Um, and I hadn't sort of realized how to make the electric engine kick in because it's not like a, you know, like a, like a, a scooter, throttle. Like a throttle. Yeah, yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. It's as I sit here going, you know the thing. Twisty, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th- that. Um, and so I was just scooting around the office and suddenly it started moving yes. and buzzing. And I'm standing there going, oh, this is quite cool. This is a lot of fun. And then it occurred to me as I'm approaching the wall. I don't know how to stop it. I don't know it. how to stop this. <laughs> <laughs> so I stepped off and it kept going. All yeah, right. Um, but a lot of fun. Did you work out what it was that you had done that had caused the motor to kick in? Yeah, I think it was I'd hit a certain speed. And okay. so I think the motor in it, uh, I assume, is it's it's like an assistance system. Yeah. So it's it's mostly I think it just you reach a certain speed and it goes. Oh, cool. All right. Well, then we're going to now we're really going this until you break and then you can start modulating your speed again. Okay, fantastic. It's a lot of fun. And I think it's mm. Peugeot's idea of no matter whether you're in a petrol engine or electric car that you'll have it in your boot and it's just a kind of, if you've parked, you need to then get to the train station or whatever. It's your next yeah. little part of the journey. Which, what a world, right? Yeah. Well, and <laughs> someone was saying yesterday that I think that's part of the idea of it is it charges in the boot of yeah. like compatible Peugeot models. Yeah. So you just yeah. whack it in the back of your Peugeot, you drive to the, you know, whatever it is, part of the way to the station, then you can scoot the scoot rest, the the way. rest yeah. of the way. It's, it's such a quirky idea. I love it yeah. so much. Yeah. It's very European. <laughs> Same here. Now, yeah, sure. Sure, sure. Um, I've been behind the wheel of the Camaro 2SS, which Ooh. is the car that uh, HSV has been converting from left to right hand drive. Mm-hmm. So it's a 6.2 litre um, Atmo V8. It's all of those American muscle car things. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm in the midst of writing that review, and uh, there are a few things in the swap from left to right hand drive that I think are just a little bit off target. Um, We'll, we'll get to, but it's all the things that you would expect um, of a car of that type. It's it's loud. It's it's brutally fast. It's got that very intimidating look to it. Mm. Um, it's twenty thousand dollars more than its natural enemy, the Ford Mustang, mm. an equivalent model, because of all the local uh, certification work that's had to be done. Sure. Um, the local you know process Swap of, job, of swapping yeah. it over, so it ends up being in the mid eighty thousand dollar bracket rather than in the, you know, 60 sort of thousand dollar bracket. So sure. you really got to want one because mm. I would argue that the Mustang, because it's straight off the factory uh, floor as a right-hand drive, mm. it's a little more polished in its execution. Um, this one, yeah, it's going to be for the people that really want to be different. They still want a muscle car, but they really want to be different. Yeah, you're going to get those sort of LS diehards who yeah. have to have that General yeah. Motors V8. Yeah, 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 definitely. All right, now, moving on, uh, and it's time for... Musquatch. Okay, so Elon uh, pondered dropping all his Tesla titles. So Grand Imperial Pooh Bar, mm-hmm. you know, managing director, CEO, whatever. He's no longer Grand Executive. chairman, of course, because he's legally God uh, Emperor. He, he can't be chairman <laughs> for the next couple of years. But he talked about dropping um, the CEO a bit, mainly to make us think about what we do at work. 
Now, so Mm. he says we're more than a title. And in effect, all of us are project managers with a series of little projects that we have to complete. Mm. So he was just having a bit of fun with the whole nature of these very uh, grandiose titles for Mm. people. I thought it was uh, quite interesting. Anyway, I, I still call him Dear Leader which I think is the most appropriate <laughs> most appropriate title. But he's also, uh, through Twitter, once again, uh, publicised the fact that Tesla's summon function uh, will be ready in six weeks. That's Elon's words. Mm-hmm. For cars made in the last two years. So a, a software upgrade will allow this summon function to work. So he says, this is a quote, car will drive to your phone location and follow you like a pet if you hold down summon button on Tesla app. Also, you'll be able to drive it from your phone remotely like a big RC car if you're in line of sight. Huh. To me, that sounds terrifying. That, that yeah. sounds absolutely it, it, terrifying. It reminds me of uh, that Bond film, Tomorrow Never Dies, uh, where he gets the little flip phone that has the mm-hmm. touchpad in it and he can control the BMW 7, 7 yeah, Series. Yeah, with yeah the, right. That yeah. rings a bell. Is that also the one where it's like, you have crashed? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just, to me, it conjures up images of someone leaning on their app on their phone <laughs> and this car making a beeline I've, for the I've phone and just coming out of, whoa. Car. <laughs> okay, <laughs> obviously it all plays into the autonomy thing and, you know, yeah. the autopilot and, mm-hmm. and everything that Tesla's been working on, but it still sounds just a bit frightening to me. And more than that, that these upgrades are just arriving mm. And Mm. there's no kind of official oversight in terms of what may or may not be workable from a legal point of view. Yeah. There's a lot of regulation that's kind of being pushed to the wayside. Yeah. This is one of the things I like about Tesla, though. They kind of, their attitude with it seems to be just do it and see what happens. Yeah, seeking forgiveness is is, mm. is better than asking Mm. permission. Which is, I agree, dangerous uh, in some respects, especially with cars. But I do like the idea that they don't, they don't think inside the, this really tight bracket of, oh, we're a car manufacturer, we have to do car manufacturing stuff. Yeah, it's stuff. a great point. They, they just go out there and they say, oh, well, actually, we're kind of a tech company, so let's see what's technically possible. Who, let's, <laughs> let's not say, oh, we need to make this because it should do this function. They, they say, let's make this so it can do everything it's possible it's, you know, that's achievable. Yeah. I, I have a question about this because in my mind, it's a lot easier to steal someone's phone than steal someone's car. Right. So if you can, if you've lost your phone, or if someone has stolen your phone and yep. gotten into it, can they yep. then also steal your? Tesla? I suppose it'll be the face recognition technology, oh, or, or, sure. or the yeah. kind of stuff that protects your data and your phone, yeah. or protect access to the car. Yeah, cool. Um, All I can think of is just that video of the hackers stealing the Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But I mean, to your point, Tom. I think it's one of the things that has been a big plus for Tesla and maybe a handicap at times. You know, yes. we're going to reinvent the wheel and do it our way. It means that some things have probably been more difficult than they needed to be. But at the mm. same time, yeah, let's do it differently. What, why are we going to follow the pack when we do it our way? Yeah. So, yeah, that's a really good point. Just to finish off on Tesla, Hot Wheels has reissued the 2008 Tesla Roadster. That was oh. the first Tesla car. Um, complete with now Starman card art on the packaging where it it sits on the rack. Um, And I didn't know until I found it yesterday that there was on the Tesla Roadster that was shot out into space and God knows where it is now, there was a little um, Hot Wheels toy stuck to the dashboard of the Tesla Roadster. And as soon as that became the case, the price of these things went from a couple of bucks to a hundred bucks. Wow. Um, and now, so Hot Wheels has reissued it. It's the same. It's the old Tesla, but it's in new packaging. Mm-hmm. And it says on the package, greetings from space and first car to orbit the sun. Uh, cool. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, the Bloomberg Model 3 production tracker this week sits at 4661, which is up 242 units on last week, 4419. So that makes 10 weeks in a row under 5,000, but it's creeping back up towards 5,000 again. Seems like a, a more sustainable kind of number. Um, 10 weeks ago, it was a big burst to get up to 5,000 to satisfy investors and shareholders and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but remember, Elon's promised 6,000 Model 3s a week by the end of the year. So we'll, we're getting closer to that end of the year. But uh, with that, I think we've reached the finish line. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Matt. Thank you. Your your haunted roads story is going to be an oversteer uh, yes, story. I take you'll it. Be able to find Fantastic. So people can follow up on that when they want to. And thanks to our producer J three. Look, he's not as bad as people say. He's much much worse. And thank you for listening. 
Please give us your thoughts on anything we've discussed today. Search for Cars God on Facebook and Instagram and use the hashtag. hashtag, hashtag. The hashtag. Use hashtag. the hashtag CG you Podcast. Suck. Or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. You can listen to and watch us on YouTube. And if you're an iTunes devotee, please rate and review us. I hope you can join us next week. Until then, a pirate walks into a bar. Bartender says, I'm not sure if you know, but you have a steering wheel hanging out of your pants. Pirate looks at him and says, Arr, I know. It's driving me nuts. Oh. <laughs>